into a quick intro. Awesome. Welcome, welcome. And we have a great presentation on authenticity today and just how to show up at work and just what are some ways of thinking about different methodologies and principles that help us to get out of our head and into ourselves, into one another. And so with that, I'll hand it over to Jamie to kick it off. Thanks, Stephen. Well, without further ado, we'll start our presentation for y'all folks here today. Thanks for joining. This topic is talking about how to bring your most authentic self to the workplace with pride. Yeah, we're going to talk about how to leverage some of your strengths. So yeah, we all have our strengths that we should strive to leverage and optimize and maximize during our day-to-day -day work that we do and contribute to this world. And so it's, it sounds, it's easier said than done, right? Bring your most authentic self can be challenging, but it has huge benefits to both your personal and career growth. It can help you provide an anchor to build stronger relationships and a clear alliance of communications with your peers and ultimately help you be a better version of yourself. So this talk today we have, it will be primarily focused around sharing your experiences on how we manage to bring our most authentic selves to the workplace, despite some tricky challenges, relationships, or miscommunications, or other elements that come in interference with that. But also, we will, today we'll talk about some guiding principles, so to help with aligning how to bring your most authentic self to the workplace and to your day-to-day -day work and life. And so hopefully that we'll, you'll walk away with having figured out whether what helps you or what gets in the way of being your best self and get you closer to figuring out who your best self is. So you'll get a little to toolbox of tools to use and refer back to. Next slide. So the first slide that we're going to talk about is purpose. So defining and understanding your purpose. And let's see. And what are your motivations more than just money? Understanding your work's mission, uh, aligning with that to your personal passions and daily work. Even though some of you may or may not be working right now, but it's like you can think about it as in future work. So what kind of future work would you want to be proud of to be a part of their mission? And how does it really align to your personal passions and your daily work and what you put out into the world and what you want to give to the world. And understanding your work's mission will help you align with your personal passions. And yeah, yeah, I think that's duplicative, but anyways. Yeah, and, and with like purpose, you know, we sometimes go into things head first, right? Where we're like, we just have to do it, you know? Even like when we talk about showing up in the workplace, right? We sometimes think about just having to show up as just something we have to do, but really it's about pausing in the beginning, right? And just taking inventory of what are you here to do? What are you here to show up to serve? What are you here to accomplish? Is it for you, right? Or is it doing something that you were intending for somebody else? And really it's about when it comes to work, right? This tricky balance of, should I just say what I need to say? Or do I navigate some interesting situations? Asking yourself, who do you wanna serve at this particular moment, right? And we talk about us versus other people. A big mantra that I go back to is how we show up for ourselves is ultimately how we show up for others, yeah? How we show up for yourselves is exactly how we show up for others. And so when we can give us this bandwidth and space to understand our purpose, we also give that to others, yeah? If you can't love yourself, how are you gonna love somebody else? <laughs> Such a good Barbara Streisand quote. <laughs> okay, next slide. 
Thank you. Uh, so the next slide is values and how are you going to hone in on your personal values and your company values? So this is like Steven mentioned earlier about how do you do an inventory check of your personal values and your comp and align that against your company's values. And, or if you're looking for a job, what are your current values right now in your current stage? And also what type of companies would you like to work for in the future? Do you care about like healthcare, health tech, finance, whatever industry and spectrum you want to be represented at, uh, do your research, I recommend. And all it really align your values to that company's core values and do dil due diligence in your research, not just what they put out in social media or, you know, talk to people on LinkedIn, reach out, have a coffee chat and actually get like the real, real with people and connect with them on a human level, not just like what they post out on social media, because that could be deceiving. And there, you can go to the next slide. Okay. So yeah, so there are yellow lines and warning lines that kind of, if you kind of feel that it makes you feel like they, that company or project maybe, or that person is going against your values, such as degrading comments, microaggression, racism, sexism, prejudice, discrimination, whatever you don't like. <laughs> so make sure to not put, brush that off and imagine that it's fine. Maybe you just need the job or you need the stability, whatever it is, it, it, it comes back and it brings toxicity, toxicity into your life and your brain and it affects your mental, mental and physical health immensely. Probably for a different time of day and different story, but we, me and Stephen both share very kind of like relatable challenges that we've had in the workplace with various elements named above, but yeah. It's like boundaries, right, Jamie? It's just, you got to set your boundaries. Yeah. You, and then we call it, I think yellow line is a really good way to call it because it's like the road, right? There are these lines here. It's not these physical barriers, right? Isn't it, isn't it crazy? We just listen to these like markings on the road. We're like, okay, you tell me where. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's interesting. If you like zoom out, you're like, if aliens were staring at us, like, this is interesting. Anyway, so. <laughs> I'd like to add to that point where it's like yeah. accessibility, where if people that have no vision, they have, they need a guiding stick and they have the, I forgot what's it called, but um, the bumpy things on the road to say, no, don't cross the street, double check, like hearing or ask someone for help before you just cross the street. This is danger. So I do appreciate that. So instead of like red line, the red tape, I like the warning signs of yellow lines and red. Yeah. That is good. So it's like, okay, we have the red, the yellow lines on the ground, right? But what are the bumpy stuff that you can add? So when you start stepping near it, you're like, oh my gosh, right? Because sometimes what happens, right, is you, you know, when people are crossing our boundaries, right, we first go, mm, it must be me overreacting, right? Does anyone else? Feel that way sometimes they're like oh no it's just me no no that's not a big deal why am i overreacting why you know and then all of a sudden like you know two days later you're like what did i do <laughs> right and so it, it sometimes it's helping to just set up these guidelines in general in just the very beginning right just so that we become aware of it might not necessarily have to act on it, right? Where it's like, you know, I'm going to call you out. Blah, 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 blah. But it's just being conscious with what's happening. And ultimately, boundaries are really, really important to put yourself first, right? Self-priority. So here's a tip. So if you ever find yourself really struggling to set boundaries, it's usually because in the moment of conflict, we don't give ourselves grace we don't give ourselves love we don't give ourselves compassion right we critique ourselves and we go into our men like headspace and we're like "Ooh, let's like try to figure all this out and so the advice is next time you start doubting yourself pour yourself out love from yourself to you because sometimes what we end up doing is we're changing right we're moving our yellow lines for people right 
because we actually want them to love us. And we're like, no, let me move these lines for you so then you can love me, come to me, embrace me. <laughs> and, you know, it just, when it comes down to it, right? Everyone is free to make their own decision. But how we show up for ourselves, that's on us to own, right? And so it was a huge, it was a great tip. Actually, I'm a, I'm a obsessive, like compulsive eater. It's really bad. And so a big tip for that was when I'm like reaching for food, right? Where it's like self-nourishing, where it's like, it's also to pour yourself love at that moment because then I'm like striving for love and food. I'm like, <laughs> you give me a pound of like cashews, it's gone. <laughs> but yeah, it's giving us this concept of love that we're striving outside of us. And so when we do that, see if something shifts. Yeah. See in that moment, if something just clicks that you're just like, hmm, interesting. Hmm, I don't need your love anymore. Hmm, goodbye. <laughs> yeah. I could have used that advice earlier today, but now that I think about it, I'm like, had I had known to pour myself a whole cup of love before I went into this meeting. And then um, also it's like, you, you notice like when people are just coming at you with in the moment of conflict and then you tend to make yourself smaller and the that person or group will b get larger and so you kind of tend to make yourself feel like well what did i do wrong what's my problem am i unworthy am i not good enough or like what's what do they not see that i'm not Thing. and so it's just there's some disconnect and so also remain calm too because emotions people tend to like think especially women unfortunately like, or people in within our community in the queer community it's like oh you guys are too emotional and so it's like they think emotions drive our intellect and our actions so don't let people take advantage of that um, and yeah just like him off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got, yeah, you got to give yourself the space, right? The space, the compassion, the grace. And sometimes, you know, a good analogy too is like, you know, purging monsoon. It's like water off a duck's back, right? Like sometimes what people throw at us, we can decide if it's going to stick on us or we just let it roll off. Yeah. You don't have to put like cocoa butter all over. You just like let it roll off, you know? And so sometimes I think about that analogy, especially when people come with a lot of, um, especially in the work setting, right? Lack of patience, a lot of hustle, a lot of frantic energy, just that they're brewing. And when they pour it in your direction, you just go, mm, no, like I don't need it, you know? And so... At the end of the day, right, it's hard to, like, say definitively what's, you know, what you do in a particular moment because everything is so different. But it's also assessing, remember, the inventory of how much energy do you have at this moment, right? And maybe, you know, another moment you can show up and you can, you know, be compassionate and open up, you know, your space for others. But sometimes you just need space for yourself. And it's okay. It's okay. And when we talk about grace and compassion, it's being acknowledging of however you're feeling and understanding that how you're feeling is valid, right? But also how everyone is feeling is valid in their own world, right? And how they process it and put it out into the world, that's on all of us to own, right? But what you feel and what you go through is totally valid because it's layered through your education, right? your life experiences, just so many things that's just happened all throughout your life. And so I would say with love is also compassion and understanding that your life is not the same like anyone else, right? Has there been another person that was born from the womb with you that has gone through your whole life experiences with you? Not really, right? So of course, you're going to have a different reaction to certain things, and it's okay. Different parents, different education, different ethnicity, different place you live in the world, different friends, different, so many different things. And so 
with all those layers, understand that maybe, you know, emotions that come up is just your way of acknowledging and processing information. Yeah. And the last part I'll say is we said it a few times in our room, but it's, we're going and getting into like the mental space now, but it's our brain is split into the left side and the right side, right? The left is our verbal processing. And how I remember that is you do like an L and you just do this. <laughs> That's how I remember it. So the, L, the left brain is our verbal processing means it just contextualizes words, right? Chair, table, me, Stephen, I say these words and you understand what it means, right? When I say chair, the word, you know, a picture of a chair shows up. But let's say, you know, I start naming colors, right? Yellow, pink, blue. And so you see those colors, but maybe there's an emotion attached to it, right? Maybe you love that color. Maybe you're like, oh, I don't like that color. That emotion is actually completely the other side of the brain, which is the emotional processing. And really, when we go throughout life, both of these sides are constantly giving us sensations, right? The verbal side is able to put words to the senses we perceive, right? It's hot, it's smelly, it's tasty, it's loud, right? We put these words. And then the other side of the brain processes it, the emotion, those feelings that you just cannot put words to. And when you can see it as a sensory perception, right? Then everything starts to be less around maybe the words we attribute emotions to, right? Like anger is bad. is what we've been told, right? Or sadness is bad, you know, but actually anger just means that your concept of reality doesn't align with what's happening outside. It's kind of trippy. And the dissonance between it is how angry you are. So anger is this tether between your internal state of reality and external state of reality. And the more angry you are, the tether is longer. Mm. <laughs> and then sadness shows up for some folks as just needing to grieve something, you know, and just giving it space. I just realized I had comments turned off. I'm so sorry. I'm going through it now. Yeah overwhelming frantic energy yeah 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 awesome okay let's go to the next slide let's do it i was just i just wanted to make a comment about how I wish okay go for it yes i wish like they as in Pixar or like adults and stuff would make a better depiction of what anger looks like or what sadness looks like because in that movie what was it like joy I forgot the name inside out yeah inside out that was like I love that that movie but it's like why does anger have to be so boxy and red I guess it's I understand the color but then the joy uh sadness is just this derpy sad crying baggy kind of kid I guess, and it's like the like emo hair, but it's like, it's, I guess, I wish they made everyone look like Joy. <laughs> I know, right? It's actually a trip. I love studying emotions. I do like a lot of it on the side. And there's this whole, I don't know if anyone will like nerd out on this stuff, but it's just how anger, when it shows up, it allows us to disconnect, right? From systems that exist or, you know, people telling us to do things, we break away from it because anger shows up, right? And so there's this concept that anger has been co-opted as a tool to suppress folks and to antagonize the emotion of anger so that when it shows up, you're like, ooh, that's not a good feeling. But in reality, it's, it's the emotion that drives you to figure out hey, do I want to align my internal world with the outside or vice versa? Do I want to align the outside world closer with my internal world? And so by antagonizing some of these really important feelings, it's able to establish more, unfortunately, like dominance over folks. And so emotions are actually really, really, really strong part of 
social movements, activism, change. And when we could see it from that perspective, wow, it's different, right? It's really different. And then the last part is when emotions show up, right? And you know that time when you like see emotions and you're like, go away, I don't want you, like, don't like get away from me, right? And it builds and builds and builds and builds and builds, right? Again, emotions are like senses. Imagine if you put your hand over a stove, right? What's going to happen? It's not the same sensation you feel at like just a longer duration. It gets hotter. It gets hotter. It gets hotter, right? It's a sensation becoming more prominent saying you got to move your effing hand. And so emotions are the same way. It's like a sonar. When it starts bleeping and the emotions start coming up, it means, hey, recognize me. Hey, this is what's happening. And when we silence it, it same exact sensory perception of smell, sound, touch, all these things, the sensory perception, the stimuli become more. And so this is when our emotions become really overwhelming because it's literally a part of us that's saying, please listen to me. This is really important, right? And why this is interesting, because sometimes the emotions don't get that big. But when we actually listen to our emotion and we either give it the space that it needs, we say, how do you respect this emotion when it shows up? When we give it the space, somehow it just dissipates, you know? Or like when you're talking to someone about something really sad that you just went through, right? And afterwards you're like, oh, the emotion just somehow dissipated, right? Because we actually gave it the space to respect it, to let it be. So it's kind of trippy, right? It's super trippy. But when we can see emotions as that, when it shows up, it's not as scary. It's a part of us. It helps us to align ourselves closer with what we really want deep down inside. The emotion is connected directly into our subconscious beyond, right, the verbal. And that's why it's trippy is because sometimes we can't contextualize it because it's not verbal processing. Yeah. Yeah, I totally absolutely agree with that. It's like one of my meditation classes is uh, to, if you, something's bothering you, if you, you're like, um, you have to recognize that something's bothering you and then you have to acknowledge that feeling and then investigate and then nurture it. So the acronym is RAIN. So it's always helped me. <laughs> so it's, it's leading to back to what Steven said. It's like when you investigate and nurture it and talk about it, then it goes away. It's like, whoa, I'm glad I had given it the energy and air and breath to make it dissipate. So it, um, like building on that is like kind of building your support system, which is like third principle. And it's building your support system at work, colleagues, mentors, HR. Uh, and then if you're really lucky, it might even be your boss. And uh, personal support system, we all have that, our chosen family and friends and professional support therapists psychologists tarot readers astrologists <laughs> whatever floats your boat <laughs> and you get some kind of guidance from your guides and spiritual guides <laughs> um that would be helpful and community support social media internet um like reddit or whatever forums you like to follow that you feel welcomed and organizations yeah just acknowledging you might not show up as courageous at day one and so how do we build a system around us that will enable us to become more courageous it looks like aria is really obsessed with therapists with also great astrology reading that's all <laughs> you know it's these are different tools right and at the same time it's it's like relationships right when we build a relationship with different folks, it's about really diversifying different folks, not to use folks, right? But it's understanding that no one's perfect, right? No one is perfect. And when we really allow that to take form, we then have more compassion for folks, right? And we provide space for folks to show up just as who they are, you know, and allow them to enter our lives. Sometimes we disconnect with people, you know, and it's okay. I'm like so much older now. And I'm just like, I've gone through so many of these like 
iterations and phases of friendships. And, you know, at one point I was just like, really, you know, just like really upset. I was just like, oh, like, why? Or shouldn't I have done something better? Or, you know, I asked myself like all these questions and I'm just like, was it me? But when it comes down to it, we all evolve, we all shift, right? Think about who you were 10 years ago, right? Or just like five years ago. <laughs> but like the, the capacity of understanding, the capacity of understanding one another is just so different. And especially as we learn ourselves, our values, our goals, we become more of who we are. And it's totally okay to find different tribes along the way across a different spectrum, you know? And I will say one thing that's just like a little more on the personal level. It's just like family and I just like, I would say, especially coming from an Asian household and just like very traditional, you know, just like being queer, which is not a thing. I also don't know anybody in my family who's queer at all. And so, yeah, it just, it wasn't a very great conducive household for queer identities. And yeah, there was a point when I just had to disconnect myself completely, you know, just for myself, just to give myself the ability to find who I was. And for the longest time up until then, I was just like trying so hard to hold on to a different, you know, it's almost like, I was, what's a good analogy? Like I was on a lily pad, right? With one foot on one and another foot on one, one foot on another lily pad and another hand on another. And I'm trying to hold them all close together, you know? And they're all trying to float their separate directions. And in that instance, right? You just become suspended in a state where you're just holding on for dear life. And yeah, it, you know, it was just one of those moments when I just had to just step away, take some time to reflect, found a great, you know, community who welcomed me with open arms, taught me so much about myself, community, how to hold space for myself. And when I was able to take time for myself, I really radically transformed at my perspective. Yeah, and I would say at one point, I also traveled alone by myself for a whole good year, just like different places around the world. And I, it was kind of nerve wracking because I'd never done that before. I'd always travel to other people because I'm like, oh no, I need people, you know? And this was one of those moments where I was like, fuck life, I don't care. Uh, <laughs> right and i just did it and then I, it was really stressful going through it because you have these vices that show up that's like like oh like i you i want to do this with somebody or I, I i need to do this with somebody or it's just all these things that come up you know and sometimes we hold on to things not because they are useful for us but we hold on to things because this is familiar to us and so sometimes the vices we have that sometimes shackle us to the things that we're trying to break free from, we hold on to it so close because we, so, we have so self-identified with it. And so that is a huge recommendation I give to folks is just take time for yourself, you know, just give yourself the space. And it's just, there's some things it's just like, you just have to do, which is take yourself out to a coffee shop by yourself, take yourself out to a restaurant by yourself. Seriously, just like go take yourself out. It is liberating. It is it you like once you get over the weirdness, you're like, I could leave whenever I want. I can just order whatever I want. I could take my time as long as I want. And it's okay, you know? And once at least for myself, when I was able to give myself the grace to do that, there's just so many things that came out, you know, like of my own skeleton closet that I just really struggled to see eye to eye with. And it wasn't until I was able to do that, that with certain folks in my family who are very conservative, which is like really, you know, 
like we just do not see eye to eye with that I was able to see it in a very different light because it's tough, right? It's, we're so critical of ourselves. And so we struggle to hold space for ourselves. And if there's somebody else, right, who's very conservative, just like has ideals set, they're even more strict of what the world is, right? And so if we struggle to already hold the space container for our world, of course, it's going to be so hard, right, to hold space for these folks. And so it's, you know, you know different strokes for different people, different, you know, everyone at their different pace. But I share this to maybe, you know, see if anyone is interested to try some of these different tips or just ways that you can find your own liberation. Yeah. And what does that mean? And however you find it is up to you. And when you're able to start finding what really works, meaning you're able to see some of your inner demons, these skeletons, and they come out and you face someone at a time and you're like what's up let's talk that's how we get through life one at a time yeah <laughs> thanks for coming james that was a mouthful sorry oh my god i just went into it <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh my goodness I, just, I really got into it yeah it's still a lot of self-work you know, it's just some folks in my family still don't see eye to eye. And it's okay, you know, it's okay. Don't let that define who you are, how amazing you are. It, it's, yeah, don't let anyone take that away from you, you know? Okay, next slide. <laughs> <laughs> so the next principle is uh, self-awareness and um, building it. Do an inventory check of your strengths and your shortcomings leverage your strengths and work on where there's opportunity to build on your shortcomings just wanted to say like your perception of your strengths and shortcomings may not be the same as what someone else's so it might be good to get a perspective of some like your best friend and then your mom and then a coworker that might have a conflict with you so just getting a broad spectrum of that helps expand your brain and really help you be more self-aware and acknowledge and accept critique in a warm welcoming fun way and that's like the next item yeah so it's, it's basically feedback is gold it's like golden nuggets of like precious information that nobody really wants to be the bad guy and say something that might not be so positive to hear and well received by you people can just say oh jamie like you're doing so great you look so nice today your hair's awesome but it's like okay but what are you really thinking underneath that brain that you're murmuring in the hallways or something <laughs> so i think just being able to as a designer and a person that values like good feed like feedback and growth and you want to be a better human being then it is very critical that you welcome feedback and critique and it's, you don't want to become a brain in a jar and just really creative tension is good tension. Um, yeah. Okay. It's, do you have anything to add to that, Stephen? Mm -hmm. I would say with feedback, again, it's the world are different hues of grays, right? It's not black, it's not white. And so when you receive feedback, right? For a long time in my career, I took everyone's feedback to heart. Where I was like, anyone said anything, I'm like, I need to apply that to my life, right? But there's sometimes people who come from a place that's just not a cute place, you know? That they're going through their own stuff. And sometimes it shows up in the workplace, right? where we may be with hyper-competitive people, we may be with folks who just don't have the stuff um, in, a, in, a, in a way that allows other people to be in the container with them. And so sometimes when feedback comes your way, that is just really harsh, really evil, right? Just like really, ugh, it doesn't sit well. First, it's just 
allow you to feel that, right? Just like feel it. Because that again is a sensation. It's an emotional state, right? And when that rings, you have to listen to it. Because once you, you know, you say, oh, don't listen. What ends up happening is like sensation, right? It's like heat. We become desensitized to it. And so that's where you see people falling into the same traps because they've shuttered the emotions that help them to drive the action that they need to shift something in life. But they've desensitized it so much that it, when it shows up in the very teeniest kind of sensation, they don't feel it anymore because they're like just pushing it away, right? So first is just acknowledge what does this feedback resonate with you? And then the second part that I always ask is, where does it come from them, right? Is it coming from a good place in their heart? Do they want what's best for me, right? And the instance, if it isn't wanting the best for me, then that's when I go, mm, yeah, like, I don't know if I need to keep it, you know? So some feedback I got along the way, there were people who said, you know, design, you know, is not the path, like career path for me, you know, it's such a waste of my time, like go back to programming, you know, you can sit in a cave and just like do your own thing. It's like, okay, <laughs> you can do that in design too. Other folks have said, you know, oh, you're like, you really like design. So just like you should do that instead of like UX, for example, right? But it's just, I, I was just like taking everyone's all these feedback. And then when you do that, you become this like hodgepodge, like, just like taffy that just collected all these like ingredients around, right? And so the next advice I have from there is find who nourishes you, right? Find the people, find the community, again, the support system of people that you just, you're like, ah, oh, this is my, like, tribe. These are the people at work, right? And then go to them and index more on their feedback, yeah? And if people aren't showing up for you, right? At the minimum, they don't give you the time of day. Why are you giving them the time of day to take in all their feedback, right? Yeah. Yeah. Dropping some gold. Yeah. You could put uh, your check in our, uh, <laughs> make it out to just our org seminar payment. <laughs> JK, it's all free. <laughs> Courage. Let's do it, Jamie. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Before we win the lottery. <laughs> oh my God, I dream for that day. <laughs> okay, so then the fifth law, guiding principle is courage. Having the strength to stand for your missions and values in order to bring your most authentic self to work. And there's a sense of courage you have to bring Without courage, it's impossible to demonstrate any kind of other virtues, at least on a consistent basis. Courage is, helps activate the values, I would say, and also brings consistency. So just like how we were mentioning earlier, how people are coming at you when you feel small and then you're just like shrinking and shrinking and your smallness is adding to, think of it as hot air balloons. You know, like your balloon is getting smaller and this person over here, this group is getting hot air and they're getting a lot bigger. And so you have to have the courage to stand up to them and say like, yo, I'm drinking a cup of love for myself. All right. And like back up, <laughs> I hear you, I see you, but I will thoroughly consider and contemplate if this feedback is valuable for me right now in this moment. And is it going to drive value? Is it going to help me? complete my project? Is it going to make me more fulfilled and feel more impactful in whatever it is that we're doing? What does courage mean to you though, Jamie? Like if you had to define courage, what does it mean for you? Courage, I mean, it's not only for speaking up for yourself, it's also standing up for others. Like I believe I'm a Capricorn. I firmly believe in loyalty and justice. And when there is some injustice in the room, I just cannot stand it. <laughs> and so I just want to be courageous, not only for me and oh, yay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, not only be courageous for me, but also like how, like 
resonating again back to what Stephen was mentioning how you show up for yourself is really how you show up for others as well. So if you can't really be courageous and stand up for your values and what you're doing, what, you know, helps you feel like you're contributing to the world and being a good person, then how are you going to sh share the same values and stand up for people, someone else? Like the same quote, how you, if you can't love yourself, how are you going to love someone else? <laughs> yeah, but yeah. So good. Yeah. Courage for me is, if I were to define it, which is like weird words, it's doing a thing that you know you have to do. You're like, you know, and you know you have to do it because it's good for you. That is courage. That that It's like that feeling, right? It's like, it's so hard to like say what it is, but it's that, I don't know. It's like, it's not conscience, right? It's not like like I don't know what's that word but it's just that that feeling that you're just like oh like I have to do it but there's that blockage of fear that exists like, okay, add to like procrastination like mm -hmm. you know for some reason you don't want to do it at that oh my moment. gosh yes for you and that, that is something I honestly have to struggle with where I'm like I know I, I know I can do that I know how to but then it's like, I don't really want to do it right now. <laughs> oh my God. I am a procrastinator. Who is a procrastinator here? It's so bad. A recovering. Yeah. Recovering procrastinator. Yeah. We should do Procrastinators Anonymous. <laughs> We're shifting our organization to be okay. weekly procrastination support group. <laughs> yeah. Raise your hand. Be proud of it. You know. Perfectionist. <laughs> or it's like, I think the perfectionism also adds to procrastination my point again leading back to the capricorn mm -hmm. <laughs> so capricornistic trait. yeah well with procrastination you know what i will tell you i would drop some knowledge on you all again it's about emotion what you're doing is stirring up emotions and you're not procrastinating the action but you're trying to move away from the emotion that's coming up in doing that thing. So you're actually trying to avoid the emotion, not the actual task itself. And so it's really about shifting how you feel about something rather than actually doubling down and doing it. Interesting, right? Mind trip. <laughs> You're like, but I put all this calendar thing. It wasn't the calendar, boo. It wasn't the calendar. <laughs> but I did more to-do tasks like boxes. No, it wasn't the boxes, boo. It's not the box. <laughs> it's what is this stirring up in you? What is this reminding you of? And asking yourself, how do I just give that space? You know, How do I acknowledge what's coming up? And then just sit in it. Yeah? Try this next time. Just be, when you feel the feelings of procrastination show up, just sit and give yourself like one, two minute meditation and just let the emotions be, you know, and just close your eyes, right? One, two minutes is not going to destroy the whole day, right? It's, we're on Instagram. It's like five hours gone. And so it's like, yeah, it's just sit with the emotion and just let it be and see what comes up. And you'll notice when you just give it space, something shifts. Yeah. I say this, I still like procrastinate. So, <laughs> but you know, procrastinate, work in progress. <laughs> We're not perfect. Yeah. I love it. I know my body says no many times, <laughs> especially during the pandemic. <laughs> Yeah, so it's just like segueing how we're all like a work in progress. And um, I feel like, uh, and I've seen and witnessed and through research, um, Brene Brown, uh, it's like, uh, if you make yourself a weakness, should, vulnerability should not be seen as a sign of weakness. It makes you human. We have emotions. We have our things that we need to make us feel like a human being. We recognizing and understanding that nobody's perfect. We're all, it's all journey here. We are all work in progress as always. <laughs> Until the day that we 
pass it on to the next life of doing whatever we're going to do awesomeness and just keeping a great growth mindset mentality allowing yourself to be wrong and giving the space the grace uh, to learn and grow from your mistakes in your own way method and time that's it you got it yeah hmm Let's do an exercise real quick before we close out for just this session. Let's do an exercise real quick. If you need to turn off your camera, go for it. You can keep it on too. But just close your eyes for a second, yeah? Just close your eyes, right? Close your eyes, yeah, mm-hmm, yeah. I see you, Mahogany, close your eyes. <laughs> mahogany, close your eyes. <laughs> Just kidding. And just find just a relaxed, comfortable seated position. Yeah. Just, just let go of some tension. Just relax and just you might give a couple sighs out. You might just feel parts of your body just relax. I'm going to recite a couple affirmations. Yeah. I am working hard. I'm doing my best. And that's enough. I show up for myself every day. And that's also enough. I have dreams, I have amazing aspirations, and I have things I want to accomplish. And I can hold on to all of them and give them the space. And how I navigate through life in my own way is all right that i don't need to follow word for word a book what somebody said what i read online blog post podcast whatever it is because the direction i take is the right path for me. I love me. Mm, it's a little cheesy, right? But just feel that, just feel that for a second, yeah? I love me. And how does that feel? Yeah? And I'll say one more time. I love me. I show up for me. I am here for me. I am here for me. Maybe give yourself one more affirmation, whatever word shows up for you. I am blank. I am loved. I am seen. I am beautiful. I am gorgeous. I am fulfilled, I am wonderful, I am living, I am conscious, I am free, I am exploring, I am exploring, I'm chasing after my dreams. Mm. I love me. Don't forget this feeling. This is how you show up for yourself. This is the power of affirmations. I know it might feel a little like cheesy at first, but it's, this is how we show up for ourselves. You know, you can enable your webcam or whatever now. <sighs> and just give a couple sighs out and just let something go. Maybe 
just let something go that you're holding on to that maybe it was just not serving you. Maybe it's something you said about yourself or somebody said about you and just, just let it go. Water off a duck's back, yeah? Awesome. Happy pride, happy pride, happy pride. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know I <laughs> this is like less of the meditation I teach a lot of meditation on the side this is like not like deep meditation that I teach but yeah it's if you have a chance to explore what this looks like yeah I hope you enjoyed that yeah you felt it this is liberation this is what liberation feels like and nobody can take that away from us yeah nobody we might have structures in place on the outside, right? Systems in place that may make us believe otherwise, but yeah. Liberation, that's what it feels like. To be free of the shackles that others put upon us. Yeah. Mm. So with that, why don't we close out the first portion of it, and then we just have a 30-minute quick activity for folks. With that, we will turn off the recording. See you at our next UX Nights.